Uh, good, good evening. This is. Uh, I would like to thank you, folks, for showing up to this public information meeting. This public information meeting is to go over a feasibility study that we've done uh, with, re with regards to remote control of movable bridges in Sturgeon Bay. Um, I'm Neil Michelson with the Wisconsin Department of Transportation. I'm the project manager for this work. Um, and up on stage here with me is Ralph Bloom from URS Consultants. Now, before we get started, if you haven't signed in, uh, there's a sign-up sheet just as you came in the door. And there's also a, a newsletter with regards to, to this feasibility study and uh, what we're looking at with the uh, possible remote ops of the movable bridges in Sturgeon Bay. Uh, what we have tonight for you is just a uh, um, just a just a an overview of the feasible feasibility study that we've uh, been working on. Um, if you have to go to the restroom, they're out in the hallway. Take a right, just down the hall are the restrooms. And also, if you have any questions, uh, I would ask that you hold your questions until the end of the presentation, and then we can answer those questions for you. As I said, this is the feasibility study for remote control of movable bridges in Sturgeon Bay. Uh, what we're going to be going over tonight uh, are the location and proposed, um, excuse me, location and purpose of the study, remote operation, other remotely operated bridges in Wisconsin, bridge configurations and protocols, current bridge operations, future bridge operation with remote control, equipment needed for remote operations, cost comparisons, safety issues, opportunities, conclusions, and recommendations. The location and purpose of study. The study location are the movable bridges in Sturgeon Bay. Uh, currently there are two existing bridges, movable bridges, that's Michigan Street and Bayview Bridge. And there's one under construction, that's the Maple Oregon Street Bridge. All of these bridges are double leaf bascule bridges. Uh, they serve the recreational and commercial boat traffic. The bridge separation is 750 feet from the Michigan Street to the uh, Maple Oregon Bridge, and then 7,800 feet to the Bayview Bridge. Bridges, they're all, all bridges are under the WSDOT jurisdiction and control. purpose of the study is to evaluate the feasibility of remote operations. Um, this is to, to take a look at how to improve the safety of the bridge operations, reduce annual bridge operational cost, reduce wear and tear on bridge mechanical equipment. What is remote operation? Uh, remote operation is simply operating one bridge from another location or multiple bridges from another location. Uh, one operator will handle multiple bridges, requires additional equipment such as cameras, monitors, communication lines, and computers. In Wisconsin, there are other remotely operated bridges. Uh, currently in Milwaukee, there are 12, remote, 12 bridges that are operated remotely. Also, in Manitowoc, there's one bridge that's operated remotely. That's on US 10. In Menasha, there's one bridge remotely operated, and there's four remotely operated bridges, uh, railroad bridges, in the state. At this point, uh, Ralph Bloom will take over in the presentation. Oops, sorry. Thank you, Neil. All three of the bridges in Sturgeon Bay are of the same type. That is, they're all double leaf bascules, they're all draw bridges. Um, there are some differences, of course, between them. Michigan Street has very low clearance, and because of that requires uh, frequent openings or at least openings for almost every vessel that passes uh, under it. There's currently uh, one operator at each bridge uh, during the time the bridges are operated, or when a new bridge gets built, there would be three operators total uh, at all times of operation. Talk a little bit about the, the protocols for the bridges. The Michigan Street Bridge operates from March 15th uh, through December 31st. Uh, it operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It opens hourly for uh, recreational vessels and on request for commercial vessels. 
uh, from January 1st to March 14th, it would open with uh, 12 hours of advance notice. <clears throat> Bayview operates from March 15th through November 30th of each year, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it opens on request. From December 1st to March 14th, again, it would open uh, on 12 hours notice. Maple, Oregon, um, the operations are not totally resolved yet. It's under construction, as you know. It will likely operate uh, similar to Michigan Street, although that uh, is currently in discussion now between uh, DNR, or I mean between uh, DOT uh, and the city and the Coast Guard. We uh, examined the opening logs for the bridge as a part of this study. We looked at 10 years of the bridge opening log data from uh, 94 through 2003. And uh, actually, since this has been written, we've updated that and looked at some of the more recent uh, information. The number of openings shows a slightly decreasing trend during that, uh, during that period. So we're not uh, able to project any great increase in openings going forward. The maximum hourly openings in that 10-year period was three at Michigan Street in one hour, four at Bayview, and um, we could project perhaps three at Maple, Oregon as a maximum. So um, if one were to total those up, you might get a maximum hourly operation of 10 openings in the three bridges. That's sort of important so that we can analyze how many operators it would take to operate uh, the three bridges. Each bridge is staffed about 7,000 hours a year. Uh, actually, the number turns out to be about 20,232 hours of paid time per year to operate the bridges if, if there were three of them. Now we're projecting three here, trying to look into the future. Generally, um, for commercial vessels, I mean for recreational vessels, an opening uh, from beginning to end is going to take somewhere between two, two and a half, three, three and a half, four minutes. It'll vary a little bit, but uh, depending upon the bridge and the equipment and the operator. So um, we had to pick some sort of sort of typical cycle length so that we could analyze. And we said, well, let's, let's round that four minutes up to six. Let's say it takes six minutes on average to open and close a bridge. That would be 10 per hour. So that's what, that's what we've selected. Um, that, that leaves a little margin of safety for operator fatigue, uh, for multiple vessels that might be going through the opening, uh, if there's a number of, of vessels or even a large vessel, and also there's some required operator documentation. So we feel that an operator, he, he might be pressed, but he could do 10 an hour. Okay, so how many remote operators are needed? If you take the demand and divide it by the rate, uh, maximum hourly openings for all three bridges predicted not to exceed 10. Uh, the rate we just talked about would be 10. Divide that out. One operator, we feel, could operate all three of the bridges on the maximum, on the maximum hour, on the maximum day. Therefore, projected staffing for the remote operations would be one operator per shift to handle the three bridges rather than three operators per shift. Two of the bridges could be operated from the third bridge. The control location, wherever that would be, would require a somewhat larger operator's house 
for the cam for the monitors and the other equipment that would be necessary to operate three bridges from one location. The new Maple Oregon Street Bridge is designed with a large operator's house. Therefore, sort of by elimination, the new Maple Oregon Bridge, we feel, should be the control location. And the picture you see there is not the Maple Oregon Bridge. That happens to be an artist rendering of the new bridge in Oshkosh. Talk a little bit now about some of the equipment needed for remote operation. Um, it needs a modern operating system with a programmable logic controller. This reduces the number of steps required of the operator for the opening. Much of the process gets programmed into the programmable logic controller, which is another name for a computer. Another item you need is cameras at your remotely controlled bridge, a minimum of four at each bridge, and some bridges may need one or two more. Video monitors at the control site, at the controlling bridge. Fiber optic communication lines between the bridges. The purpose of the fiber optic lines is to transmit the uh, control signals from the controlling bridge to the bridge that's being remotely operated. Modernization of the bridge operating system will promote the conversion to remote control. Some lighting of the waterway at the remote bridges will likely be necessary. And microphones and speakers for verbal communication between all the sites. This is so if there's a pedestrian that wanders out on the movable span, you'll be able to see them uh, quite nicely in the, uh, in the monitors, and you'll be able to speak to them because there will be a microphone at, at your disposal and speakers on a remotely controlled bridge. I want to talk a little bit about the labor cost, which is really one of the issues here. Without remote control, the existing operator costs for two bridges. The total annual 2005 operator cost was $516,000. We got this information from the county. The projected annual 2010 operator cost would be up to 580000 this is increases in, uh, some increases in wages, I'm sure, but also increases in hospitalization and insurance and those types of things. The projected operator cost for all three bridges for 2010 would be $880,000. With remote control, the projected operator cost for three bridges Again, about a third of it, because we're going from three operators to one, $301,000. This is a little graphic that basically portrays what that last slide had on it, the 880 uh, versus the 301 would give a subtraction and annual cost savings in 2010 with three bridges of about $579,000. Talk a little bit now what it's going to cost to do all this. There's going to be some conversion cost. Maple Oregon conversion cost has been calculated out at $366,000. The backup for all this information is in our report, which uh, the DOT can make available should you want to look at it. The Michigan Street conversion cost is uh, a little bit higher, 389000 And the Bayview conversion cost, which includes some electrical and control equipment upgrades, which are not currently programmed, a million one forty-seven for a total of about $2 million to get all three bridges set up uh, so that Two of them could be remotely controlled from the other one. 
with an annual savings of projected of 579,000, we'll be able to recapture the cost of conversion in about four years or less. I think every time we talk about this subject and every time we have a meeting, usually the word safety comes into the discussion about this matter. So we want to talk a little bit about safety, safety issues. We think there's going to be a lot of improvement in some of the issues that currently exist associated with operating some of these bridges. There's some blind spots that are out there today uh, in the bridges. Certainly Michigan Street has a number of blind spots that you have to deal with to operate that, that bridge. We feel those will be eliminated totally or largely eliminated with the remote control cameras. And we're talking, we're talking now state-of-the-art camera, state-of-the-art monitors. These will be significantly better than what you currently have on Michigan Street. I realize there's camera two and monitors there, but we're talking much newer, higher quality equipment. We looked at the safety record in Milwaukee and talked numerous times to the city, people that run the bridges there, and they, they have not had any reported incidents at any of their remotely operated bridges, nor have we had any at the bridge that's remotely operated in Manitowoc. So remote operation itself, per se, does not seem to indicate any safety problems. The risk of an operator-induced bridge damage will be lessened enormously with the computer-controlled operation, the PLCs. We recognize that uh, there are some difficulties closing some of these bridges and much of that will be taken care of with the computer. Standby operators may be needed during inclement weather. That is still being studied. Fog, snowstorms, we recognize that the Sturgeon Bay bridges operate uh, in, sometimes in very inclement weather. And so we're going to be looking at <coughs> Uh, possibly in addition to the cameras, uh, infrared imaging, uh, perhaps radar is a possibility to help the operator during those times of bad weather and or calling in a standby operator to operate the bridges exactly as they're operated today. All the bridges will still be able to be operated locally from the bridge tender house at that bridge, even though this equipment would be installed. If the department goes forward with this, there are some opportunities for some other types of, of benefits that could accrue. Some of this uh, may be important to some people. For instance, a record of the gate violators would be available on the cameras. The cameras could be recorded continuously, and uh, any time anybody violates the gate in any way, uh, you could probably read the license number. You may even be able to recognize the individual. Better communication between the bridges and the police, the fire, county sheriff, uh, could be provided electronically so that the, those locations could actually know uh, when the bridge is, is in motion, when the bridge is open, when the bridge is closed. Electronic data collection would be available, various kinds of data, including the data that you currently record by hand could be collected electronically. And electronic coordination between the bridge and traffic signals should there be traffic signals nearby, that would also be an option. 
Okay, the study concludes that remote control of movable bridges in Wisconsin has been successful in some locations for over 15 years. Remote control of the 10th Street Bridge in Manitowoc has been going on for some time and has been successful. Remote operation of the Sturgeon Bay bridges is feasible. Cost to convert will be recovered in less than four years. If the Bayview Bridge is included in the remote operation, it would require some electrical upgrades. Maple, Oregon would be the most appropriate control location. We feel the department should budget funding and move forward with plans to remote control the Sturgeon Bay bridges. Conversion to remote operation should proceed as expeditiously as possible following the completion of the Maple, Oregon bridge. And even then, it, it would take several years for all the work to be done and for that to happen. Maple, Oregon bridge should be the control center. Implementation should be in stages. Michigan Street first, then Bayview. Thank you, and we'll now try to answer any questions you may have. Yes, sir. Not taking any uh, doubt with what you presented, you stated in your written material that Sturgeon Bay is the most active voting area. When you talk about the river areas of Milwaukee that you show, Manitowoc with one bridge and so on, you're talking relatively light or basically non-existing, very small traffic, especially with boats that require bridge openings. Uh, with Sturgeon Bay's degree of traffic, with the marinas located where they are and people darting in and out of marinas, coming out at the last second to make a bridge, etc., cetera, uh, what provisions are there for, well, I'll say it's emergency type action or whatever to recognize that those sorts of things will happen as opposed to your experience elsewhere in Wisconsin where you don't necessarily have the same condition? I'm not sure I totally understand what your concern is. You're, you're saying emergency situations, people darting out from the marinas to make an opening. Um, we think that, that, the, that the cameras and our experience at, at this point is that the cameras can be set to capture um, those areas so that we think you'll be able to see that boat trying to make the opening perhaps better with the cameras than if you were actually in the bridge tender's house because of the blind spots that exist in some of these bridge tender houses. Um, again, to, to try to address the general concern of that, that you stated uh, of these emergencies, I believe you said. Was that the word? Yeah, unexpected. Unexpected things. Well, um, of course, these will be regular bridge tenders that's operating the bridge. Um, one emergency that might happen would be a bridge wouldn't open for some reason, or a bridge wouldn't close. Certainly, that's an emergency. And, um, what, what would happen then would be essentially the same thing that would happen now. We'd bring in another bridge tender and maintenance people and try to attack the problem. If the bridge is open, we'll try to get the bridge closed. Um, so I, I guess that if you could be more specific, I could maybe answer your question more specific, but uh, pretty much the same as it is today the, uh, the bridge tender would have communication uh, with, with uh, his superiors and with the county and with DOT. Um, does DOT staff want to add anything to that? To well, his question? I, I think you, as uh, Ralph has stated, if there is a situation where the bridge, uh, you were unable to open it or close it, um, then you would follow the same protocol that you, that you currently are following, which is notifying the DOT and putting us on notice and we can get personnel down, whether it be county personnel or, or ourselves from the bridge section, 
come down and take a look at it and, and get whatever problem is corrected. Um, are you guys bridge tenders? I am. I am. Some, some of you are. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, you're talking about Manitowoc and Milwaukee remote control. My question is on um, pedestrian traffic. Yes. We have, because we are a tourist area, we do have a lot of foreigners coming, and a lot of them don't understand English. Yes. Whether they're driving or walking, that we've had to physically go out there and take them by the hand and walk them off, at least I have, or tell the person in the car to keep going. What kind of, if we're on the Maple Oregon Bridge, and that happens on Michigan Street, you can have all the speakers you want, but if they don't understand what you're saying and they don't see, they're just hearing a voice from someplace, people freeze. I, I guess I can appreciate that. And, uh, and if you have a commercial vessel, what do you do? I'm the operator, Coast Guard regulation, I have to open for that, I have to open that bridge for that, because it's a federal waterway. That person is there, they don't understand English, and I'm on a different bridge. That's my fear. Because I've had to physically go out and remove people off the walk or the draw. Right. How often has that happened? Has it At least a half a dozen times. In the last year? Or? I'd say in the last couple of years, because we've been getting more yeah, tourists. It does here. happen. I guess what he's getting at, if you take a freighter, he gives you the call to open that bridge, yeah. that bridge better go up because he's committed. He can't thread around like a little tugboat or a little pleasure boat, but a 600 foot or 800 foot vessel, they're moving. They don't go backwards like <coughs> beam wind against them. They're screwed. They can't drop their anchor because that channel isn't, you know, you know, if you know anything about anchor roads and all that it does not work. It's that vessel has to keep in motion to navigate. That's something Maple and, or Maple, Oregon and Michigan, that's, but Bayview, that's, so like I guess if something happened between that, you're not gonna get over there. And there's just a channel there. Do you, you think, uh, you know, as far as from your experience as bridge tenders, do you feel that uh, some type of signage on the bridge would be beneficial to the folks that don't understand English. We've got signs on the bridge already. Yeah. Stay yeah. behind the gates. Yeah, it's not in. It's in English. Yeah, in English. You yeah. put it in ten different yeah. languages, I guess. Well, I guess what? Yeah. Is there a predominant yeah. nationality? Now you got Everything. people from okay. where are they from Canada that are coming down on the They're English tour boat. Huh? Yeah. Canadians are English. Mm -hmm. They're coming from all over the place in that tourist season. Yeah. Plus, exchange students from all over. I guess to answer your question, I know what I'd do. If she was on the movable span or he, I wouldn't open it. Well, no. Then, then you have that freighter coming. You well, that freighter, that freighter has to, that captain has to be in control of his vessel. Mm -hmm. And you got a radio and you're going to say to him, I got a problem, Captain. Hold her up. My friend, uh, <laughs> if I may, no, um, I think your cameras might address this situation better for the operator because you're going to be standing that whole sidewalk now. And I mean, what we have on the Michigan Street right now is the carriage. Yeah, for the, for the sidewalk is what I'm getting. Yeah. At. That's so that would be our concern. So now, if we got a freighter, call us and tell us. You know, we as operators, if that if we can see that sidewalk then we should be okay because we should be able to see and we'll be able to time it. Okay, well, oh, we got a bunch of pedestrians coming. I'm gonna put the gate down now then. I'm gonna open the bridge earlier. Oh well, yeah, you're gonna do, we do that. I right. mean, that's well, normal. Well, I you. <laughs> but, well, that's mm -hmm. where we don't have the cameras now on the side. No. You can't see the far side. No, the only thing I use those cameras for is when I'm in that bridge house, it tells me that the boat is right. clear though. That I, that, that's the only thing that that camera is of any yeah, use to me, yeah. or if one is coming. So I, I'm hoping your cameras will address that situation. That's I, no, I that's realize there's a lot better cameras nowadays, but like I said, these are prehistoric. I think you got them from the Stone Age, or yeah. I mean, but if there's a freaking spider up there crawling around. <laughs> Is there other questions? Yes. 
Are you making any provision for this with the current construction of Maple Argon and with the planning of the refab, the refurb of the Michigan Street? Yeah. Just on the likelihood of? Yes. Good. Yes. I'm sorry. It's very hard to see. Yeah. yeah. Can you give me an idea of how many openings the Sturgeon Bay bridges have compared to, say, Manitowoc and Milwaukee? I don't have that, that data with me, but I, I can tell you, we also did a study on um, Oshkosh bridges. And the Oshkosh bridges open on demand. And so there's many more openings on the river in Oshkosh um, than, what, than what you have in Sturgeon Bay because Sturgeon Bay basically is opening on the hour. Yes. Before the Michigan Street Bridge went to the elbow, we were the busiest bridge in the state of Wisconsin. That was a fact that we were told. And even now, we're still, even at the hour, we're one of the busiest bridges in the state. Busiest? Of all nations. I don't know, I can't give you a number, but that's what we were told by the DOT, that we're still one of the busiest bridges, being on the elbow. One of the, one of the things, just to, to add to that question, and we can certainly provide that data, but uh, um, what, what we found at Terrell's point is when we looked at Oshkosh, when we looked at uh, trying to see what they did in Milwaukee, uh, Manitowoc, when we looked at Menasha, and now Sturgeon Bay, it, it, it really doesn't, it, the point is not uh, how many total openings one, any one bridge has or, or how many openings over a season. Uh, it, it, it really boils down to what's the maximum number of openings you expect to have in one hour? It's kind of that peak, peaking uh, characteristic. Because over the course of a season, if you're, if you're a bridge that's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, you may end up with a lot of openings, as opposed to an Oshkosh where it's a 16 hour day, uh, 12 or 16 hour day, depending on the day of the week. Uh, but at peak times, you know, as, as Ralph said down in Oshkosh on the river, um, holidays, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, very, very, very busy. Uh, so I think the important, the important number is uh, what was shown in the, in the presentation here, and, and if I recall correctly, uh, those you know, maximum amount of openings in, in a 10 year period of time based on the bridge opening records, and, and if I was, remember correctly, Ralph, th those are, uh, was that after the bridge went to on the hour? Well, I don't think so. It, but these were, if, if, if I recall though, the three at Michigan Street did not peak at the same time. And four, four. four. Maybe, that wasn't the right. same hour. No, it was not. So, so the, you know, this is really trying to worst case, worst case scenario. Uh, but these are when do we go to hourly? These these are probably after the hourly. Uh, we've been told by the DNR, or by DOT previously with the new bridge construction decision making process that after the new bridge was up, we would go back to opening on demand, or the, any other bridge in Michigan would refurbish, that we'd go back to opening on demand. You're sh still showing opening on the hour. You mentioned that you're negotiating with the city for something. What do you see as the worst case situation? Every half hour? Or are you going to stay to the hour? Or are you going to go to the demand? The, the department's here, and I guess um, I let them speak for themselves rather than me trying to speak for them. But I, I well, I, I, I would say that it's, it's, it's unfortunate if you were told that well, it was a that Michigan state. Street was, was going to be open on demand. That's after it was rehabbed, yeah. that the Coast yeah. Guard wanted it to go to. No. It, that, that it's incorrect information, and, and that's not what we're doing and we're going to maintain the hourly openings. The reason that they never went to hour or hour and half hour wasn't so much for wear and tear on the Michigan Street Bridge was for traffic. A absolutely. And, and, and there, is, there, is, there is very little, very little chance, I think, that you'll see more openings on Michigan Street, more than the current hourly. So no, we don't have any plans to increase the frequency of opening. But to Ralph's point, uh, Neil and, and Dale are, are still working with the city getting 
as we speak, getting very good suggestions from them on how we might uh, improve the opening durations through there, coordinate it with the traffic and the traffic signals to provide uh, good service levels on the waterway, but improved service levels on the roadway. And, and I think what that in, you know, will mean is, is some combination of, of openings between the two bridges to accommodate that. So. Also, my question is, what, what do they anticipate for the Mole Bridge if Michigan is going to stay on the hour? Same thing. You can open both bridges at the same time? No, it's the same time. Well, we've had some input from the city um, just today, as a matter of fact. And what they have suggested is that uh, the Maple Oregon Bridge would be opened 10 minutes uh, before the hour. And on the hour, the Michigan Street would be open. And then 10 minutes after the hour, the Maple Oregon Bridge would be open again also. Now that's, of course, going to depend on the size of the vessel. If there's a lot of small boats that don't need uh, to have an opening at the Maple Oregon, then obviously the Maple Oregon won't open because it will be uh, higher off the water than Michigan Street. So it really you have three scenarios. One is that for large commercial ships, they would both be open at the same time. The second scenario would be only that the Michigan Street bridge would open on the hour due to the size of the vessel, smaller vessels. And the third alternative probably would be that it would be open 10 minutes prior to the hour and 20 minutes after the hour, or, I'm sorry, 10 minutes after the hour at the Maple Oregon and then once at the Michigan Street. So then you have to stay in between the two bridges for 50 minutes. Right. Well, I, I, 50 I, I, minutes, if you're coming from Bay, from oh, Michigan Street, or from Michigan, oh. Lake Michigan, at five minutes after six, you're gonna go through at 10 minutes after six. The Michigan Street Bridge opens at seven o'clock. So you'll have a 50 minute wait. I'm not, I mean, that's a fact. No, no but that's the right. also, then the bus should be there at 10 minutes to I, I think, I think, there will have to be some education of the voting public also that these are the set times that the bridges would open. Um, you know, and, and yeah, there might be a boat or two, I would feel that possibly would get caught in there and miss the 10 minute opening. Um, but you know, how many up? I think that would happen once to that voter. They'd realize that, you know, I really should be on time if I want to get to. Here's the set times. And depending on what is ultimately determined. I mean, it's, it is a situation where the voters also have to be, I would think, somewhat responsible to understand that, okay, the, we know when the bridge is going to open. I should try to get there for that time. Uh, go ahead. Did I understand you that, let's say I'm, I'm coming from Lake Michigan going to Green Bay. I'm going northerly or uh, northwesterly. Mm -hmm. The Oregon Bridge would open 10 minutes Prior to the Prior hour. Prior to the hour, the element open on the hour, so you'd almost be able to go right on through. That's correct. Now, coming that, the other that, way, that is one suggestion that has been uh, proposed to us by the city. Yeah. So, yeah. so is, would the Oregon Bridge be opening twice? In yes. the, That's correct. Okay. Uh, possibly. That is one scenario based on the size of the vessel. Well, I'm if, talking about a sailboat. Okay. Yeah, okay. Let's take a sailboat, for, for instance. Yes, then if they're coming from Lake Michigan to go to Green Bay, they would want to be at the Maple Oregon at 10 2, or right? And then once they passed the Maple Oregon, they would get to Michigan Street. They would go up, that would go up on the hour, and then they'd be able to proceed through to Green Bay. And if someone's coming the other way, they could be at Michigan Street on the hour, and then 10 minutes later, the Maple Oregon would go up again. They'd be able to proceed over well, to Lake Michigan. That also might solve another yeah. problem, which yeah. I, I wonder yeah. about is they're going to be gathering on both sides, and um, you know, when the bridge opens now, sometimes <laughs> It's a little tense under there. Right. This way you'd have one group going before the other group uh, uh, heads between the stand. Right, well, it's be four, four, going up on a plane trying to get the road again. <laughs> yeah. He's coming from the north. Is that? You know, it's going to be a, a situation where the, where the voting public will have to be educated as far as what the times are, what's ultimately decided. And, 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 and you know, one of our goals on, on any of this remote control is to not uh, reduce you know, service levels on the waterway. I mean, we, we don't want to implement something that's going to make the waterway less pleasurable for the you know, recreational boaters. Uh, but, I mean, the change here is we have, a, we, have a, we have a new bridge. You know, we have another bridge in the mix. And 
And so you got to figure, obviously, figure out how they're going to work together. And to your point, if if the voters uh, either understand the schedule and, and for some reason show up uh, just after the uh, bridge closes, uh, there will be times when people will be inconvenienced. But uh, that that's part of having a second bridge. You know? They'll learn one time. They'll learn. You know what? <clears throat> I've seen them tied up at the, at the marina there, but right? uh, at least. And he said, oh, did you, were you five minutes late? And he said, no, I was just 55 minutes early. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you're a recreational pleasure boater, you shouldn't be in that big a hurry anyway, right? Yeah. Except it's blowing 45 miles an hour and the waves are building. Well, there's, there's yeah. probably yeah. Issues yeah. that get you through on oh, yeah. Yeah. the yeah. weather, so I mean, it's, yeah. it's had that happen already. Right. I, think, I think the thing you gotta, we got to remember is that what we're talking about now is just a function of having two bridges. Right. It has nothing to do. You'd have the same problems if you had a, an operator sitting yes. in the bridge. Build into your budgets a pittance sum with adequate signage on both bridges covering hours of operation. Large print visible from a distance. And probably, how about a phone number to call for us? There is one on the phone on the bridge. Is, is it legible? So, call for so, uh, Probably eight sheet of plywood. Yeah. That or the numbers are about five inches tall. Okay. Probably Radio. better if it was down on the dolphins instead yeah. of the other yeah. 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 Radio channel that you monitor. Yeah, yeah. Just, well, that's emergency channel. That's 16. We monitor steady. You know, if you guys could gather any information on what languages we're talking about here, I understand that might be anything. Yeah, from the Ukraine, they come on well, the Well, but if there's something that's being out of the Certainly the department, I think, would entertain putting up. They just stand there. 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 They just stand Turn them off. There's people that are like tours of the city. They freeze in their car. You gotta go out there and walk around underground. Home on their window, basically, because they're scared. Fire truck wants to get the heck out of the way. Yes, you in the back there, you have a question? Yeah, Yeah, I just wanted to say that I received a call from a friend that was opposed to uh, remote monitoring uh, and asked if I was coming to the meeting. And he was telling me how dangerous the bridges are when they go open because his son was actually <coughs> on the bridge yesterday uh, while it was going up. And I said, well, wait a minute, that's with a bridge tender on it, you know? And, uh, you know, it's really arguing about the safety of the uh, community. With a bridge tender, without a bridge tender, uh, the same foreigner can stumble into our pathway with the blind spot removal odds are you're going to eliminate uh, that more frequently than you do now because you aren't seeing them before you aren't catching them until the 11th hour and you have to run out there and grab them you know so so I, I think you have a better opportunity with remote control uh, being implemented in the community than you do today and by example of uh, the child that was on there yesterday. So, um, what time was this yesterday? I don't know, but I could get the details for you. Yeah. What, where, what city? Sturgeon Bay. On the Michigan, Michigan Street, Street Bridge. Bridge. Yeah. Yep. We operate those gates <laughs> outside. I, I, I can get you the info. That wasn't the point. Look <laughs> both ways, and I will not operate that draw until the people are on the other side of the gates. Well, another thing too, I think, is part of the problem part of the re refurbishment of Michigan Street is the gates will go farther away from where the draw is. Mm -hmm. Right? Because okay. you have to right now there's kind of a limited no man's land between the draw and the gate. Yeah. If you had that longer, you'd have more of a more of an opportunity to detect an intruder an intruder. Yeah. I, I would also like to see better, better gates that you yeah. can't sneak yeah. underneath. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. gates to cover from waist down. No. So, no, that's not, not solid, but just the drop bars like, or something. Mm -hmm. Like, chain, not chain, but I mean, they have like. Well, you can, you know, you, there are, there are like, gates that come down with pipes, right? So they're vertical, no, they're and then like they come a, down. Like the but they're still not going to. I mean, yeah, yeah, but people who like to duck under and figure they can beat it. Yeah. Well, that's. Well, I had a burglar yesterday the other day because I had the gate down and I was, <laughs> you know, in the process of lowering the gates and he hurtled over the one and he was running. And I had to sit and, you know, wait for him to. 
I like all shot. <laughs> Well, the, cam the cameras are going to give better views of those areas. Yeah. And also, um, you know, if someone jumps the gate, you will have the capability of talking to them using microphone and speakers. Uh, you know, we're, we've been working in Menasha. We've had a remote contract there, remote operation of bridges. And we're, we're in the early stages there of, of doing that. Uh, we're doing a lot of testing yet and running the bridge remotely. Um, and we have had instances where people have ducked under the gate. But I, I would like to let you know that as soon as we get on the radio and we tell them, please step back behind the gate, you know, they respond immediately and they're back behind the gate. Granted, there's probably, there could be some folks that, that aren't going to listen, but from our experience in Menasha so far, and it's probably happened half a dozen times, as soon as we've gotten on the speaker and notified them that we know that they're inside the gate, they back up right away. Oh, they spook them a little bit. I think it does. It, uh, there's, there, I think the surprise is that all of a sudden someone's... You know, the, the, other, the other thing that this came up actually when we met um, with uh, John and, and a couple of the other bridge tenders uh, a month or so ago was the, the issue of uh, foreign language, you know. And, you know, I don't know how many different foreign, you know, if it's a, if it's a wide variety then it's kind of hard to get at. But, but one of the thoughts we had is if, you know, if there's, say, Spanish-speaking or, or Hmong, and you have a predominant, uh, one of the, with the technology, one of the things we could do is we could have presets. You know, we have the, the, the communication technology speaker. We could have presets, multiple language presets. You know, now, here again, if you have a wide variety, you know, you'd be pushing a lot of buttons. And, you know, you'd probably have, like, yeah. blinking lights would be probably something. But, you know, maybe there's some other international type of symbols or, or signs or, you know, active signs that could be used. Uh, it's interesting because, you know, this, this, this particular, you know, problem uh, hasn't come up in, in Oshkosh or Menasha or other places, you know, so where... How much foot traffic do you get on these well, other they, they get a fair amount, but I don't think maybe they have the, uh, just the like, tourism. Just like I said, in 92 when I started out there, everybody knew it was all local people. Everybody knew the rules, you know, and it just kind of followed us. But like I said, in the last eight or nine years, it's done more diverse than good workers. Yeah. Oh, that's a... Does anybody else have any other additional questions? Or comments? Well, I, think, you know, I don't know if we talked about any type of implementation plan. Did we have that in the presentation? I, I mean, you know, generally our, our, our thought is is that we would we would look at you know um, uh, implementing some of this with the uh, including it in the Michigan Street Rehab, and so that when we get to the point of uh, opening up the Maple Oregon and, and Closing Michigan for its rehab, um, and, and then once that's done, uh, we would have Maple Oregon and Michigan Street capable of of the remote operations. And you know, it would be likely that we would we would move through and, and implement gradually, slowly, patiently to make sure everybody, the operators, are comfortable with it. Uh, that's what we're doing in Menasha this this summer, and. Uh, we certainly don't want to, you know, jump head first, you know, uh, or, or move too quickly into this stuff. Uh, we want people to feel comfortable uh, in doing it, gain some confidence. Uh, Bayview would, would, you know, realistically uh, come later. And, and if we were operating Michigan Street, the rehab Michigan Street successfully from Maple, Oregon, uh, we would look at that moving on to be. For the Michigan DOT. still going to be operated on the gear system, the direct opinion gear, or is it hydraulically operated? Or Michigan Street? Yeah. It'd be basically the, the same type of operation, like the motors. You mean with the jack traps and the pinion gears? And well, that would be probably, uh, it would be different a little bit for the system. Okay. I mean, it's still electric motor that you have there now. What happens if you look the other way on this thing and say, gamble? For the future, and you've got the year yet for the Maple Oregon. Build that so the bridge tenders have the tools and the toys to play with as though you were implemented. You're going to have at least two years for the refurb on Michigan if to experiment on the new bridge. Sure. And then uh, 
if that looks good after the first year or something, you finish Michigan up with it, and you're, when you, Michigan's ready to go, it's ready to go. Um, I could see that that'd be something. It, all it takes is you guys gambling and putting the tools in on the first bridge so that you can get some experience with that while you got two years down in Michigan. I assume it's going to be about that time. The DOT, how long have they been doing that? I, okay, Michigan, Oregon is going to open up tomorrow. When is the Michigan Street Bridge going to go down? Well, is it going to be that same day? I, the reason I ask that is because of employment. Right, yeah. And then you're going to have it for a couple of months, and then you're going to lay somebody off again? We, you know what, it's a very good question that, that we don't know exactly what the answer is, but ideally, the day you open Maple, Oregon, or, or shortly thereafter, uh, you would begin to rehab on Michigan Street. For, for a variety of reasons, you know, a smooth transition for existing bridge tenders, as well as getting Michigan Street rehab. I mean, get, getting going on that. So it, it's actually one of the notes that I think uh, we have to follow up on and, and, and coordinate. And Before it's open, is it even training, you know, for the operators? Oh, I mean, you know, <laughs> of course. That manual used to be that. <laughs> oh, and the question that. about when, when you rehab the Michigan Street Bridge, is it going to be open? Yes. It's, it's, you just say open while they're working on it. Unless they yeah, shift. Well, yeah, no, it's going to basically be. It's going to have to be open. Yeah, they, if it's, if it's non functional, they have to have it open. Okay. Well, they put it down for two years here, a long way around. <laughs> If not, uh, I'd like to thank you folks for attending this meeting. Um, again, if you if you haven't had a chance to sign up, there's a sign up sheet in the back, and there is uh, some newsletters back there also with regards to this subject. So, thank you. Thank you.